And last year, we did a series titled Jesus is Worth It, where we talked about cost, worth, and value. And over the course of that series, we learned some valuable principles. Things like trust and value are connected. The more you trust, the more willing you are to pay the price. The more you love, the more you give. You decide what you're going to value. And worth is determined by what someone else is willing to pay. Now today, I want to come from the other side of cost, the side that we don't like to talk about as much. Some decisions and actions have a high cost that you never counted on. And if you could turn back the clock, you would do things completely different. You wouldn't enter that relationship. You'd never take the first drink. You would completely avoid those people. You would not make that financial decision. You wouldn't click on that link. You'd have chosen a different college or a different career. You might have a different set of friends. You'd do anything to do it different now that you've discovered the cost. From the outside looking in, that's somewhat predictable. People watching know what's going to happen because they've seen other people take the same path and pay the price. But when you're in the middle of it, it can be really hard to step back and see what the cost will be because there are emotions involved. You love him. You really want that. You have to have it. It's perfect. It's fun. Makes you feel good. When you really want something, you ignore the cost. You sacrifice long-term good for instant gratification. You ignore what's right for the sake of right now. You give up your future for a fleeting moment of pleasure. You know the cost but you decide that you're immune from it, that somehow you're different. I want to tell you a story. For some of you, it will be familiar. Others of you have heard of the characters, but never really noticed the lessons of the story. In the beginning, God created the world, and then God created man, Adam. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. God placed Adam in the center of the Garden of Eden, an amazing, perfect place filled with plants and animals and a beautiful flowing river. Not only was the garden beautiful, but God himself spent time with Adam. They walked and talked together. In the garden, Adam enjoyed the blessings of a relationship with God. Come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on. Closes and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tell. 
God's plan for you is the same as it was for Adam in the garden. God wants to be in relationship with you forever. Not an on-again, off-again relationship, but a lifelong, fully devoted, completely committed relationship. When you're in relationship with God, needs are met. When you're in relationship with God, you experience peace. Adam didn't have to worry. He wasn't afraid. When you're in a relationship with God, you have joy. Some of you have been trying to do life on your own and you're struggling. And I want you to know there's a connection. There's a reason you don't have peace. There's a reason you don't have joy. There's a reason for that loneliness. The reasons why your needs aren't being met is simple. You're not in a relationship with God. If you want to enjoy the blessings of God, you have to be in relationship with God. In the gardens, the blessing of a relationship with God, we're tied to the responsibility of that relationship. God told Adam, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Adam had clear instructions from God. This is not a gray area. Adam had one rule. Adam, you can live in Eden. You can eat what you want, do what you want. One thing, you must not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. Cost of disobedience was also clear. If you eat this fruit, you'll die. That's the price you will pay. Now, we don't live in the Garden of Eden, but we also have clear instructions from God. In the Bible, God clearly states what he requires of his followers. We spend a lot of time looking and learning about that. And we will be held responsible for those instructions. You can't pick and choose. You can't decide to follow the ones you like and ignore the ones you don't. You'll also be held responsible for all God's instructions. And not only do we have instructions... Just like Adam, we know the price. We know the cost of disobedience. Verse 20, for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Adam was guilt-free in the garden. Adam and Eve felt no shame. Can you imagine life without guilt or shame? No prayers of, please God, don't let anyone find out. No lies, no cover-up, no sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach, no trying to hide from problems, no avoiding eye contact or ducking calls, no careful planning to make sure you don't run into your friends from church while you're hanging out with your friends from school, no regrets, no shame, no guilt. Because Adam and Eve had done nothing wrong, They were able to stand before God the way he created them with no shame, life without guilt. The garden was an amazing place. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you'll die. You won't die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be up and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her And he ate it. Up to this point, life had been good. Living in the garden meant receiving the blessings of God. In the garden, Adam was free to communicate with God and receive clear instruction. In the garden, there was no guilt and no shame. But now Adam had a choice to make. 
Obey God or give in to temptation. Adam didn't think through the cost of his action. Adam didn't consider the consequence of disobedience. In the turning point of the story, Adam disobeyed God. And that one act of disobedience cost Adam everything. The price was incredibly high for one piece of fruit. It was the world's most expensive apple. Adam's sin cost him big time. Maybe you're faced with a decision. It's a turning point. There's a lot riding on it. Sadly, all too often you ignore the cost. You think you're above the cost. Or you decide that even though other people pay that price, you won't. You say things like, well, that might be the cost for them. It won't happen to me. I'm in control. I can do it in moderation. I know some people get hooked on prescription drugs, but I'm different. I can handle it. It won't cost me as much as it costs all those other people. Let me tell you, I'm so concerned about the opioid crisis in America and the level of addiction. I I was at the oral surgeons this week, and they said, it's going to be okay when we're done. We'll, We'll give you this. We'll give you hydrocodone. I said, no, 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 don't give that to me. He said, well, you're going to need it. I said, that's the problem. He said, I don't want it. He said, it's going to hurt. I'll live with the hurt. I I don't. I would see too many other people. I don't want to get anywhere near that stuff. Well, I've heard all the supposed effects of pornography. It could hurt my marriage. It could hurt my relationship with God. But I'm just looking. It's harmless. I'm not the kind of person who will ever turn into an addict. I'm in control. I can live a life outside God's law. I can do what I want when I want. I can have sex outside marriage. I can do my own thing. I know some people ruin their lives, but I'm different. I'm strong. I can quit anytime I want. I'm completely in control. When the time's right, I'll I'll do the God thing. It's not going to cost me as much or keep me as long as them. I could go on and on. You justify your decision and action and somehow assume that you're above the price, that the cost is different for you. You're special. You're strong. You're in control. The cost applies to other people, not you. This fruit from the tree won't hurt me. God can't mean that. And ultimately you discover the price is not negotiable. Sin carries a high price. That price is predictable because it hasn't changed. You pay the same price Adam and Eve paid. And the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Moments before their disobedience... Adam and Eve stood complete and whole in the presence of God. Now they realize they were naked and they were ashamed. For most people, the highest cost of sin is not physical, it's emotional. The fear of being caught, the fear of consequences, the need to be forgiven pushes you to new levels of anxiety. Guilt drives you crazy. It leads to depression, to anger, to fear, to shame. When you disobey God, you live with guilt and shame. That's an expensive choice. That's an extremely high cost. Even people who've never been in relationship with God experience guilt and shame. Sin has the same price for everyone. And for some of you, the overwhelming emotion in your life is shame. You wonder, how could I ever have done that? How could I have gone so wrong? How can God forgive me? How will I ever face people? And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he's walking in the garden in the cool of the day. In one of the saddest sentences in Scripture, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We don't know a lot about Adam's interaction with God before his sin. But I imagine Adam looking forward to the visits from God. When God came to the garden, 
Adam ran to him. Adam got one-on-one FaceTime with God. But as soon as sin and disobedience came into Adam's life, he became so uncomfortable that he tried to hide from God. It seems pretty silly, doesn't it? You ever play hide-and-seek with a preschooler? Have you? They're horrible at the game. Absolutely horrible. They, they hide in the same place every time, and then you, you pretend like you can't find them. You know exactly where they are because they're a preschooler, and you're an adult, and you're smarter than them. They hid from God behind some trees, <laughs> which, oh, by the way, God created You can't hide from God. As a result of his sin, Adam lost intimacy with God. What a horrible high price. And that is a natural result when you disobey God. You get uncomfortable when people talk about God. You stay away. That's why we worry when you don't come to church. We've seen the pattern. Avoiding church and staying away from spiritual leaders is a good indication you're making bad choices. You stay away because disobedience makes you uncomfortable in God's presence. You don't want that feeling. The Bible says God is light. When you're around God's light, it shines in the darkness of your heart. And when you're in God's presence, your sin is brought to light. You may be able to hide it from other people. You can't hide it from God. He already knows. Adam went from walking and talking with God on a daily basis to hiding from his heavenly father. What a high price. And you'd think that would be enough, that the consequences couldn't possibly be worse. Adam and Eve felt shame. They lost intimacy with God. But that wasn't God's discipline. That was just the natural consequences. Adam and Eve still had to stand before God. The Lord God called the man, okay, where are you? Like he didn't know. Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. He was afraid God would see him naked, so I hid. God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Adam said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. God rebuked Satan, and then to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you'll give birth to children. And for the first time, Adam and Eve, subsequently all mankind, discovered the overwhelming sensation of pain. Adam realized that the one he loved, Eve, would experience pain. It's one of the worst results of failure and sin. When you disobey God, you don't just hurt yourself, you hurt others. This is tough. But when you sin, you're not the only one who suffers consequences. It's not just you who suffers, but everyone around you, including the ones you love the most, also suffer. When you lose your temper, your words of rage are forever imprinted on the minds of your children. For a moment of pleasure with another woman, you destroy your wife's self-esteem and you break up your home. Your addiction costs everyone around you. Your parents spend their life savings putting you in rehab. Your greed and disobedience keeps your family from experiencing God's blessing. The people you love experience grief, loss, fear, sorrow, uncertainty, financial ruin, loneliness, desperation, bitterness. And because Adam sinned, Every woman for all time experiences pain in childbirth. Ladies, the person to be mad at is Adam. But the consequences just weren't for Eve. Adam also suffered. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded you, that you must not eat, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, to dust you'll return. 
And Adam discovered how high the price was for sin. He lost the blessings of God in his life. He lost the Garden of Eden for the sake of one piece of fruit. On the other side of Adam's disobedience was hard work, toil, and difficulty. Five minutes of pleasure caused Adam a lifetime of heartache and pain. Now, it's important to remember, this is not arbitrary punishment. This is not God taking things away from Adam because he was mad. Adam chose this. He chose disobedience. Adam knew the cost and forfeited the blessings. When you disobey God, you forfeit God's blessings. That's the price when you choose to live outside God's plan. God is not some kind of divine punisher who gives to you and then takes away. But when you sin, when you choose to disobey God, you remove yourself from God's blessings. And you leave the land of God's blessings for the land of never enough. Galatians chapter 6 says, Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. On one side is God's plan for your life. Where you experience life the way God intended. Jesus called it life more abundant. On the other side is the world outside God's blessings. Say no to sin. Live in the land of God's blessing. Eat the fruit and choose to live in the land of never enough where there is fear and sin and trouble. In the land of never enough, there's never enough peace. There's never enough love. There's never enough happiness. There's never enough to satisfy. You search and search, but you can never find enough in the land of never enough. Your sin is your choice. When you give in to God's, when you give in to temptation, you move from the land of God's blessing to the land of never enough. When you choose to ignore God's instructions about your money, you choose to move out from under God's hand on your finances into the land of never enough. Of course things go wrong. Of course you don't have enough. When you have sex outside marriage, you move that relationship out of God's blessing and into the land of never enough. Of course it fails. You can be doing everything right in other areas, but that one area of disobedience moves you out of God's blessing. You say, well, I'm doing everything right. Why am I not getting blessed? We have this tendency to compartmentalize sin and assume it won't affect other areas. But just that one act of disobedience removes you from all the blessing. So the Lord God, verse 23, banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. When you move away from God's plan, you move away from God. Disobedience is separation, and that's the highest price of sin. You're separated from God. We don't like this price. We try to minimize this price. We try to find ways around it. But it's just too much, life without God. You say, well, God can't do that. What kind of loving God would separate himself from me because of sin? One bad choice, one hasty, passion-filled decision. When you think that way, one more time, you're trying to negotiate the cost. You're saying, that's the cost for other people. That can't be the cost for me. Let me be clear. God doesn't separate himself from you. Sin separates you from God. By your actions and decisions, you choose to live outside his protection and blessing. God hasn't moved. You have. Maybe that's where you are. Whether it was one act or a lifestyle of sin or a pattern of disobedience, you never thought it cost this much. You never imagined the price of sin would be so high. 
Life outside God's blessing and presence is horrible. And you say, well, thanks, Rod. That was a wonderfully encouraging message. So because of what I've done, I have to endure shame and pain. I'm uncomfortable in God's presence. I'm separated from God, and I'll never have enough thanks. Well, here's the good news. You don't have to stay that way. You have a choice. You can choose to continue to pay that high price, or you can choose to experience life again on God's terms. Paul wrote about the price of sin. He said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God sent his son Jesus to pay the price for your sin and to take upon himself the consequences. On the cross, Jesus took on guilt and shame. Jesus took on hurt and pain. Jesus made a way for you to once again be comfortable in the presence of God and to leave the land of never enough and to return to the land of God's blessing where there is more than enough. You don't have to be separated from God because Jesus made a way back. What we deserve is God's anger. As a result of following sinful, disobedient desires, we deserve to be punished for our sins by an angry God. But instead of his anger, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. Instead of anger, God gives you grace, the freely given, undeserved favor, forgiveness, and love of God. And grace changes everything.
God's grace changes everything. Would you bow your heads with me? Maybe you have made decisions and choices. And you recognize while I tell this story that because of your choices, you've moved from the land of God's blessing to the land of never enough. And all of a sudden you make the connection. Why there's never enough fulfillment, never enough happiness, never enough peace, never enough money, never enough joy. And you connected it and you realize you're paying the price for disobedience. I want to pray for you. You say, Pastor Rod, please pray for me because I need the, I need God's grace applied to my disobedience. I need his forgiveness. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm just going to pray for you where you're at. But would you just raise your hand so I know? Yeah, there's a lot of us. Would you do one more thing? Would, if you raise your hand, would you just stand right there? Again, I'm going to pray for you right there. But you say, well, what will people think? Don't worry about that. Because everybody in this place has been at, at that moment where they needed to apply his grace. Don't you dare allow fear of people who, who are wrong to keep you from experiencing his grace. If there's somebody that looks at you and says that, they need to stand and experience his grace because they got problems of their own. I want to pray for you. If someone's standing near you, would you stand with them? We're going to pray. And part of the reason why I like to have somebody stand and pray with you is because one of the fears we have uh, when we've been separated from God, we not only fear God's reaction, we fear what other people will think. And I want you to know we love you. And if God forgives you, we have to forgive you. I want you to know we're just we're at we're on the same journey. We're just at a different point. And so the people standing to pray with you, they've been exactly at that spot and experienced his grace. And they are thrilled to pray with you to discover that grace. They're gonna pray, and then in a moment I'll pray. But if you're not standing with somebody, you just quietly bow your heads and pray. If you're standing with somebody, I just want you to pray out loud so they can hear you pray. In just a moment, I'll come back and I'll conclude with prayer. Lord, we come to you today and we ask for your forgiveness. We recognize, Lord, that we are experiencing the, the consequences of our choices. And Lord, having lived in the land of never enough, we don't ever want to be there again. And so we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your grace applied to our sin that moves us from the land of never enough back to your presence and back to your blessings. Lord, thank you that we can let go of guilt and shame and all that junk that's associated with it. And we can, we can be in your presence, forgiven and clean and whole before you. Thank you, God, that we don't have to worry about what you think or what other people think because your grace, your grace overwhelms the choices we make. And so we commit ourselves to you. Lord, help us. Help us from, from this moment forward. Help us to make right choices. Help us not to make choices without first considering the cost. And thank you 
Thank you for loving us even though we foolishly walked away from you. Thank you that you've never moved. That you're there for us with forgiveness and grace. We are so grateful to you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.